Hello and welcome to the 53rd episode of Adam Alonzi's podcast. Tonight we will be discussing the relativistic transactional interpretation of quantum mechanics with Ruth Kastner. Sense, but process two is this ordinary deterministic evolution and then what he called process one was the the measurement you know the magical thing that nobody seemed to be able to understand and he was one of the first to say well that's about consciousness you know and there's like consciousness collapses the wave function so because von neumann was a very very smart guy the vast majority of people that that i talk to are are you know basically taking that as as red taking that that to be definitive well he said it and he couldn't figure out how we get this measurement transition so therefore it must be true and there are all kinds of variations on that and the whole the whole reason we ended up there is because people have not been aware of this idea of the the transactional picture where absorbers really do actively do something and that that is fully capable of precipitating measurement so that's just you know to kind of go on a bit bit long that's where i am that's what i've been thinking about lately just sort of the daunting specter of the um bringing in consciousness and subjectivity to try to make sense of measurement when um you don't need to at all and then of course the the problem with when i say something like that is that people get all, um, you know, they kind of slide into, oh, the hard problem of consciousness and you're denying consciousness, which of course is, no, I'm not, <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not denying. I think it's great. We're conscious. I, you know, I celebrate consciousness, but the whole kind of conflation of issues surrounding subjectivity and consciousness with quantum theory has been just totally unnecessary. So I'll, Take a breather there and see if the, any of them. <laughs> if you're still awake. <laughs> yes, I expected you to completely eviscerate the Copenhagen and other interpretations, but maybe we need a little more historical context and some explanation for why TI and PTI are less popular right so yes yeah, so i sort of started out with you know maybe maybe um preview of coming consternations but yes as far as the the basics um for readers who don't really aren't familiar with the interpretation um you know the i guess i don't know how much time we have but um the basic idea of the transactional picture is that um, when you have a measurement or a quantum process, say, in which a typical process would be, say, an atom emitting a photon, emitting a you know, quantum of light, and then that quantum of light is absorbed at, by some other atom. Okay, so in the usual way of looking at things and, you know, the usual Copenhagen way and the usual... Um, usual way of, of looking at quantum mechanics, people think of the emission as the primary thing that's like the only uh, kind of a freestanding process where, okay, something's been emitted and it's going out and then it's interacting with other things like the other atom that might absorb it. And this is, all of these processes are deterministic. They're, they're described by the Schrodinger equation. And so, and the technical term for that is unitary. So because standard quantum mechanics only has these features, it looks completely deterministic and there's no way to say or give any reason for why anything ever really got absorbed, that photon ever really got absorbed somewhere so that the atom that absorbed it really became excited and, um, and things have a definite outcome. So that's the standard way of looking at it. Now, in the transactional picture, that isn't the whole story. And it's based on really a different theory of fields called the direct action theory of fields. And this is very um, 
not known at all, really hardly at all, because it's something that was developed by Wheeler and Feynman back in the 1940s. And they themselves moved away from it for various reasons, not because it was really wrong, but but to, to just kind of give a, a quick um, summary of the direct action theory. <clears throat> in that theory, you have not just an emission activity, but you have a real absorption activity. So in order for any energy to be created at all, you have to have not just an emission process, but you have to have an active absorption process. And the active absorption process involves the generation of some strange field quantities. And that's another reason it's kind of been ignored. The, these field quantities are the advanced solutions. So these the absorption process involves um, a kind of reverse time feature. And this is really a major reason why people were kind of queasy about it, because it sounds unphysical. It sounds, you know, like, why are you working with these advanced states? Because we don't see, in the real world, we don't see things like energy going backward in time and so on. But, um, and without going into all the technical details here, in fact, those advanced absorber responses contribute to the process of emission so that what you get in the real world is even though we have these these advanced states being participating they're not standalone they're involved with what's happening with the emission process as well and if you look at the technical papers which i can give references to it's all quantitatively very well defined in the sense that these um, the emission and absorption processes do give rise to a real um, manifestation of real physical energy that is the photon that really goes from the absorber to the emitter in a forward time direction. And so there's no strange, you know, at the observable level, there's no strange advanced kinds of processes. But because, so, so the, the bottom line is absorption is a real activity in the direct action theory that underlies the transactional picture. And so if you take that into account, that actually breaks this deterministic evolution so that um, you've got taking absorption and the process of absorber response into account, you, you completely, you get a complete account of measurement from within the quantum theory, as long as the quantum theory is based on this direct action process. So, um, you know, and that it, to the extent that might sound like hand waving, you know, I can, there are, there's very quantitative, very specific presentations of that. <clears throat> and you can quantify the circumstances of absorber response in a very, uh, in terms of coupling amplitudes and transition probabilities. So it's all very well defined. You know, you'll often see people saying, oh, you know, oh, absorber is just a stand in for observer and you can't, you don't really know what an absorber is. Well, that's just completely false. It's not a fair, it's not a fair statement at all because we do have a complete well-defined account of the circumstances of absorber response. And it is indeterministic because you can't provide a causal deterministic account of when or how under what circumstances there will be a response, but it's very well defined it's an indeterministic process. So, so that's kind of the background of how the transactional picture, if it's adopted as part of the quantum formalism, then you get, you actually get a perfectly good, well-defined account of the measurement transition in terms of our usual quantum systems, our, our, our atoms that when they are excited, they will serve as emitters. When they're in a lower state, such as a ground state, with the capability of being excited, then they act as absorbers. So it's um it's a very naturalistic explanation, and it's it's very well defined. And so it's actually just false that you need to have this idea of consciousness being invoked explicitly to explain what measurement is. I think a good illustration of PTI's clarifying power is its interpretation of the horribly overmentioned Schrodinger's cat experiment. Right. <laughs>
Yeah, I mean, you know, that the, the Schrodinger's cat is, is Schrodinger's um, exasperation with this linearity, with the, the deterministic evolution and the fact that he was pointing, highlighting that in the standard theory, there's no reason, there's no justification for ever saying that you got a specific outcome. And that that's the thrust of that. And of course, you have no problem in the transactional picture if you take absorption into account as an as a real physical process because you can look at you know you've got your unstable atom there um, and its possibility of decay which is precisely quantifiable and then you have um, the rest of the experiment which has atoms in it you know that can absorb the um, the Geiger counter or whatever the walls of the box can are absorbers and they are ready and they are described quantitatively by probabilities of responding you know with this absorber response that then precipitates the measurement transition way before you've got any anything like like a geiger counter in a superposition so you'll never even get to that point because you've got these microabsorbers everywhere and they they have an overwhelming once you put you know a significant amount of absorbers in, around a, an emitter you're going to get with certainty within a, a very small amount of time you're going to get a response you're going to get collapse and that's why you don't have cats in superpositions the heart of quantum mechanics, according to Richard Feynman, is Thomas Young's double slit experiment. Yeah, um, and in um, in the TI picture, um, you know the the photon really is a wave. It um, the the basic entities really are waves and this is where we get to the sort of PTI, the thing I've called PTI, which I've now kind of changed to RTI to stand for relativistic because that was actually the main feature of, of my development is that it, it's, um, it's made in, into a relativistic theory as well. But, <clears throat> but the basic entities are, um, you know, what we would consider field excitations. So, so if you consider um, the quantum electromagnetic field as the sort of uh, basic entity that that is is in the background that can be excited by by its sources, then what a photon really is is an excitation of that field, and and these are these are wave like entities. I I view them as possibilities because um, in my uh, approach to the transactional picture, the only things that are really in space time are events that are outcomes of measurements. So for instance, when you've got this photon in or an electron or whatever quantum object you're dealing with, in the two-slit experiment, um, there's nothing paradoxical about having a single quantum kind of go through both slits because at the at the micro level, at the quantum level, we're dealing with with possibilities that are interacting at a level of possibility. They're not literally on a trajectory in space-time. The only thing that exists in space-time is if you have a result of a measurement such as you have um, a photon source in the two-slit experiment and then you have a detection screen where you have individual little pixels where, where that photon could be detected. What you have is real energy being delivered from the source to a point on the screen, but that energy was not a little blob that went on a space-time trajectory. In other words, so if you have a two-slit kind of effect where you've, you're seeing interference, that energy did kind of go through both slits in a sense. I mean, it didn't have to be localized. It's a two-slit transaction, and that just means that it, um, it has no localization. It was not localized to either slit. So, but because it's a wave, its fundamental nature is a wave. There, there's, in my mind, there's nothing really paradoxical about that. Which harkens back to Aristotle's potentia. Right, yeah, this is what I've been developing also with some colleagues, um, Stu Kaufman and, and Mike Epperson. We have a, a recent paper that that uh, we're 
it's been submitted somewhere, but um, it was actually featured in Science News, which was nice. And the idea is is really also what what Heisenberg talked about and proposed early on: the idea that quantum systems that we need a new category for understanding them, that they, they're not space-time objects, but they are these potentiae. So they are precursors. They are, they are um, entities that act kind of behind the scenes that are necessary but not sufficient conditions to have a real space-time concrete phenomenal outcome. So that, I think, is a... And I see that idea coming up a little bit more nowadays where people are a little feeling a little more able to talk about the idea of, of potentiality as a real thing. Um, so I'm, I, and I think that really helps us to, to understand these weird quantum uh, effects, the, the non-locality, the lack of determinacy, all of these features of, of quantum objects that seem so counterintuitive. Well, it's because they're not space-time objects. So, you know, obviously in our ordinary space-time realm, we are used to things being very concrete, localized, and we're, we're used to having energy and influences transferred in this sort of what I call a bucket brigade kind of way where, you know, there, it's all very local and you can see step-by-step step in a, on a space-time trajectory how an influence is being delivered from one thing to another. And those, of course, are what those kinds of local influences obey relativity. They can't exceed the speed of light. But clearly in quantum theory, we've got these non-local connections, the correlations of the, the bell, the EPR bell um, situation with two entangled particles. And if you think of all of these quantum objects as potentiae, as as sub-empirical, meaning they're not, they're not in space-time, but they are precursors to space-time events, then it becomes much more natural that they could kind of communicate to each other this way, that they're not, they're not explicitly sending any kind of controllable signal, but they are commu they're in communication such that they can give rise in a well-coordinated way to the space-time events that we do see. So I think it's a really promising way forward to understand quantum entities that they um, it's hard for us to think of uh, to, to kind of think outside the space-time box and of course most physicists um, although I, I see a softening now but I can remember maybe 10 years ago if I would say this to to a physicist you know I'm dealing with the idea that there are real physical objects like electrons photons and so on that are not in space-time that they would just kind of look at me like I was completely crazy because for most physicists real the term real means existing in space-time. And that's a, a metaphysical position. I mean, it's just, it's not something you can demonstrate, but that's a, a metaphysical position. And I, that's what I'm suggesting. We need to kind of realize that's a purely metaphysical position and we don't need to adopt that. We can have the idea that, that things can be real, but they aren't space-time objects and rather they're precursors to space-time objects or space-time events. This poses a lot of questions, and one of them is where do you make the cut between macroscopic and quantum entities? TI gives a wonderful account of this, and I discuss this in both my books to some extent. Um, understanding our unseen reality, I think this is in chapter five, where I, I give a, a discussion of this. Um, and rather than there being a cut, there's sort of a transition zone. Uh, we, we can think of it as the mesoscopic, you know, we have microscopic, mesoscopic, and macroscopic. And in the mesoscopic zone, the, these are these are objects such as um, very, very large molecules, such as buckyballs uh, that has 60 carbon atoms. So once you get to an object that has a significant number of, you know, what we call degrees of freedom, basically constituent systems such as atoms and molecules, then you get a very natural um, increase in the probability that there will be a an absorber response somewhere in that object simply because for an individual potentially absorbing 
objects such as an atom, you have a very well quantified probability for that object, for that atom, single atom, as to whether it will it will give an absorbing response, whether it will generate what's called a conformation wave, one of these advanced states. And so since that's very well quantified, you have the square of the coupling amplitude is one ingredient in that probability. It's the fine structure constant. <clears throat> and that's an ampl basic amplitude for the emission or absorption of a real photon. And that's something Feynman said. So it's not something that I've just kind of invented. It's actually already there in the basic physics that that the coupling amplitudes basically the charge the charge e of the electron is the amplitude to emit or absorb a photon and here's where where we we need to remember that emission and absorption are both truly understood as dynamical properties and this was you know even implicit in in Feynman's thinking even though he eventually just went to the standard standard quantum field theory rather than the direct action theory. It is st still part of the standard physics that there's an amplitude, basic amplitude to absorb, just as there's a basic amplitude to emit. And, and so when you take these, the fine structure constant characterizes this probability now of emitting or absorbing. And then you, you also have to take into account the particular transitions between states. And sometimes there are many, you know, so you have to sum over them. But there's a specific calculation you do to quantify the probability that any particular atom will absorb. And of course, that's the probability that you'll get this measurement transition because in the transactional picture, the absorption means that something active happened, that, that this confirmation was generated that breaks the unitarity, that breaks the linearity, and gives you this measurement transition. So then at the microscopic level, it's very unlikely that probability turns out to be very, very small for an isolated Anyway, um, so fine. So, so we've got, basically we can quantify for an individual atom or molecule, be, depending on its circumstances and its state transitions, its probability for generating that key absorber response that precipitates this collapse or this non-unitary measurement transition. But if we have a larger object that's an assemblage of such systems, then all we have to do is, is um, look at the overall probability that any one of those, any one of its constituents responds, and that's calculated in, in my books, and it's basically you just have to say, what is the probability that none of these would respond, and then take the complement of it, and that's the probability that any one of them would respond. And it turns out to very nicely scale with the number of constituents, abs absorbing constituents. So I think that for a buckyball, you know, just for a very rough calculation and not worrying about the particular state transitions. But if you actually do a mesoscopic object like a buckyball and you say, okay, it's got 60 atoms and the basic probability that one of those would con would would actively confirm, would, would act do an, give an absorber response is, you know, 0 .07, 0.07 or something like that. And if you you then look at the probability that any one of those 60 atoms does respond, then for the buckyball itself, you get a probability of about a little more than a third that it will respond. And which is kind of significant, you know, it's it becomes much more likely that this complex object will precipitate the absorber response and the measurement transition, but it's far from certain. And so you you see that you get this very nice um, scaling through this mesoscopic zone where the more constituent absorbing atoms or molecules that an object has it comprising it, the more likely that object is to precipitate this measurement transition. It's, uh, it's really a very nice account. It, it, um, it, it lines up very nicely with our ordinary experience where, you know, when, when we're getting with very microscopic systems, um, they, they retain their co so-called quantum coherence for a long time and they can do these interactions that you know seem wouldn't work for for something like a chair you know but the larger you get the harder it is to preserve these these quantum coherences and and that's really very nicely quantified by taking absorption into account and one way you illustrate this is with the photoelectric effect
Yes, that would be yeah one one example of um, a, a situation where um, a clear outcome occurred is, is a case where you have photons bombarding you know a piece of metal and you're getting electrons coming out. Well, um, there was real absorption by the metal of those photons in the transactional picture. And so something really happened. You know, you have space-time events corresponding to that. And you can say, you know, when you detect an electron that, okay, this electron really came out, that something determinate happened. The absorption of the photon energy was a real physical thing and the measurement ended there. You know, because when you when you look at Feynman's wonderful discussion in the Feynman lectures, even he is having this problem where he has to say, put fin you know, when is the experiment finished? And he has to put that in quotes because in the usual approach, you can't say why an experiment is ever finished. But but the beauty of the transactional picture is you certainly can. You could say it's finished because there was absorber response. And so with something like the photoelectric effect, the experiment was finished in the sense that a photon really got absorbed by a particular electron in the metal and that electron really went out. And it, there's a very clear point at which something happened and where no cats are in any superpositions and no electrons or, or or detectors or anything like that are in superposition. So we, we can say why an experiment is finished. And there are ways, tools for understanding the unseen realm. De Broglie waves are one of them. Yes, I mean, what, what um, the de Broglie waves are what I was referring to earlier, the, they're, they're really sort of waves of possibility in, in my approach. So, um, you know, when you think of the electron in which, which his original idea of having the electron in the atom, not as a little corpuscle orbiting, but rather as a kind of a standing wave. Um, I, that's really, I think, a more accurate picture of um, of the electrons behavior in the, in the atom that it is a spread out thing um, it's it's wave like it's non localized and the the way in which I think we make progress is by understanding that as as a form of this potentia potentia so that it's not it's not like a water wave. It's not like, you know, a, a slinky or, or something that we're used to picturing, but rather it is really um, a wave of potential. I think it's sort of funny when people criticize PTI for making use of Hilbert space when the Everidians say, well, the world, the whole universe divides over and over. William of Ockham be damned. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so if, if the criticism is that I'm reifying Hilbert space, well, yeah, everyone does that. <laughs> you know, I mean, basically, if you are realist about quantum theory, then it's simply, you know, realis, realism about the theory just simply means that you think that the theory has the form that it does because it's describes some, describing something about the world then its form is a Hilbert space structure. So clearly, if, it, if you're going to be realist about the theory, then that structure is referring to something in the world. And what we need to do is just understand, well, what is it that it's referring to? Because clearly, space-time isn't described by Hilbert space. You know, so There's something else weird and that behaves strangely that is described by Hilbert space. And so this just simply tells, you know, this is simply a proposal about what that is. So yes, you're, you know, good point. It is funny when, if that's used as a criticism, then, you know, it's sort of, um, sort of a strange criticism to make because A, you know, other people are doing it. And B, if you're not going to, if you're not going to think that Hilbert space somehow is referring to something in the world, then you're basically being anti-realist about the theory and you don't need to be anti-realist about it. I mean, you can if you want, you know, but um, the tradition of science is, is to think that we're learning about the world. And, um, and I think that people who are quick 
to adopt an anti-realist approach to quantum theory have just kind of given up too soon. They, they've given up on, on finding a referent in the world for what the theory is talking about. And I, I think we have a perfectly good one. And it, I mean, the challenge is that it requires we expand our understanding of what reality is. And there are a lot of people, I mean, I know I have a lot of colleagues who are very unwilling to, to allow the idea that real, physically real, does not equate to space time. They, they very much want to keep that idea that, look, we're doing physics, physics means, that if it's real, it's a space-time object, and the rest is just new age mysticism garbage, you know? So that's, if they want to think that, okay, but that's a metaphysical position, you know? So to me, I mean, what amuses me is that they are very, they're very clinging to a metaphysical position that has nothing to do with anything empirically demonstrated or anything that science tells them. And, and of course, the exemplar of science defying that kind of approach is Ludwig Boltzmann, who, who proposed atoms that at the time he proposed them were in principle unobservable objects. And, and uh, you know, he was given a lot of grief for that, but he turned out to be right. So I, I do think that people who who are you know uneasy about being realist about quantum theory and who don't want to give up their metaphysical definition of real meaning that it has to be a space-time object they 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 need to kind of have a bit more open-mindedness and and remember people like Boltzmann who pioneered the way forward by 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 what according to his colleagues was dabbling in in metaphysics One topic then perhaps that we might want to revisit is the idea of, um, as you just mentioned, actualization of, of transactions in the, in the transactional model corresponds to um, the idea that we're establishing space-time events. So um, where people usually think of space-time as the whole of reality, and so what I'm doing in, in the transactional picture is proposing that we have to broaden that idea. And I'm not sure if I mentioned before, but others, others are starting to consider this. Um, Anton Zeilinger had suggested not so long ago that we might need to rethink our ideas of, of space and time, and uh, especially the idea that, that space, space and time and, and the, the space-time manifold uh, is usually thought of as being all of reality, that that's what it means for something to be real, is that something is a space-time object or event. And the, the way we kind of, um, uh, we start to question that in, in my approach and say that actually in, instead what we want to consider is that the, the entities described by quantum theory are really not space-time events or processes. So rather they're precursors and they're, they're necessary but not sufficient conditions for there to be space-time events. So, so when you have an actualized transaction, what that is is the establishment of space-time events, in particular the, the emission event where a quantity of energy, momentum, and other conserved quantities such as angular momentum, if that applies, that that quantity is transferred from the emitter as an emission event to whatever absorber kind of wins the transactional competition that I, I think we talked about before, so that we have an absorption event, so that the, the actualization consists of the emission event, the absorption event, and the link between them, which is this transferred quantum of, of energy momentum. So that's kind of the new, the new idea here is that space-time events emerge from the quantum level so that we're, we're making a distinction between that which is actual, meaning the, those space-time events that are established, and that which is more of a kind of potentiality in, in the Heisenberg and you know, Aristotelian sense, that it, it really is, these potentialities really are precursors 
to space-time events so that they're real, but they're not, you know, they're not part of the, the space-time manifold. So that's kind of, I think, the conceptual challenge with, with the picture that I'm proposing, the, the idea that uh, we, we need to get away from this idea that everything happens against a space-time background and that, uh, you know, it's usually thought in most, most interpretations of quantum theory kind of take that for granted, that everything happens against a space-time background. And instead, what I'm proposing is, is that space-time is not really a background. It's, it's a domain that emerges from the quantum level. So that's kind of, hopefully that's something that, um, you know, we, we hadn't been able to get to last time in terms of aspects of the ontology. But it does tie into an important point in one of the critical ways that RTI differs from a lot of major conceptual models of the universe is that it's compatible with a block world idea. It's you don't exactly agree with the block world model. Well, it's, you know, whether or not it's compatible, I think um, in if we were to try to have to to put the RTI picture in a block world ontology, then we lose any of the dynamics. You know, we then we're just kind of saying, well, you know, all that it could really describe would be kind of the re the static relationships between and among all of these space time events that, according to the block world view, are all that there is, and the the, the whole story about you know the the fundamental ontology. So that's where, if you try to do that, I know, for instance, um, Tim Maudlin had remarked just kind of informally in an email exchange with with a friend of mine that. Um, that he felt there wasn't any real collapse in the transactional picture because you have to have the, is the way it's usually thought of. You've got sort of the future um, absorbers in the future responding to things, uh, you know, processes to their past and so on. And so if you take this literally, if, you, if you're sort of thinking of this space-time container or the space-time background, then there's no room for any kind of dynamical collapse because the events are already there. You know, it's sort of like there's no work for for the collapse to do. And so that was that was Maudlin's concern. And um, that's why and I'm kind of I've also you know written a, a paper about how I don't think there's any real dynamics in a in a block world. So that's why I'm not a fan. I mean, I, I think that I know there are people who have proposed block world ontologies and in that kind of an ontology for quantum theory basically you get an epistemic account so that what you have is um, events that are that are all there in in the block from past to the end of time and so what we're ignorant of them of course from our vantage point and so the the assignments for instance of quantum states that we make to systems are based only on our limited knowledge so that the quantum state becomes an epistemic quantity in, in the sense that it's not referring to something in the world, but rather it's a description of, of the extent of our knowledge, which is partial. So that, you know, that's what you have to do if you want to have a block world ontology and people do that. It's, and I'm, but that's not, you know, that's not really my proposal. So, I, I think someone might say, well, it's compatible in the sense that you could you could make a logical correspondence between actualized all the actualized transactions and all of the space-time events that are in that ontology exist already, but there's nothing dynamical. So you would lose the sense of uh, what I think is really kind of fundamental to the physics in that in the direct action theory which is the basis of of ti and rti that's a dynamical account it's interacting fields fields um you know emitters emitting a time symmetric field absorbers responding with an out of phase time symmetric field and if you have a block world then all of that those processes can't really be happening because there's no place for them to happen in so that's kind of why i, I feel as though this this approach is really surpassing the idea of a block world. And 
explain what a block world is. So a block world ontology is the idea that all space-time events exist in a kind of an equal status. So there's no real past, present, and future. There, there are just um, a whole bunch of a set, the entire set of events that comprise the space-time manifold exist in some sense in a giant block and from, from the beginning of the universe to the end of time, so they all exist in an equal status and there's no, there's no sense in which there's a, an actual flow of time. So according to this view, the reason we seem to in experience a flow of time is because it's just, it arises from our perspective as creatures that somehow move through this block. So that's the, the basic idea. And of course, the reason I'm a little dubious of it personally is that is that if you want to and, and of course it's very popular and people a lot of people think that that's demanded by relativity theory this idea that you minkowski space like a space that you could draw a space-time diagram of is a real thing that exists in a timeless sense and that's um it's a very tempting view and a lot of people subscribe to it the the problem though is that they kind of have to help themselves to this idea that we're moving through this block of of space-time events that that already exists in some sense, and there's no there's no explanation at all of why it is that we would be moving through per perspectively, kind of moving through this block. So that that has to be a primitive in that account, and um, you know there are lots of reasons why, in fact, we don't have to assume that a block world picture is required by relativity, even though that was a natural assumption and a lot of people did did go that way. But it's doesn't it's not really true at all. And there are counterexamples to the idea that relativity requires a block world. Uh, one of those in particular is by Raphael Sorkin and his colleagues where they have a kind of a growing space time or a kind of an, an account of space time that really does have a flow to it. So it's not a block and it's it's more of a space-time emergent picture. And you can do that and you can still have relativistic covariance and 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 so on. So it, it isn't it really isn't true that relativity requires this block world picture, even though a lot of people think so. And this has implications for the arrow of time, which is something a lot of very bright people have talked about. Right. Time. Yeah, you know, I think Lee Smolin and others are are kind of coming back to the idea that we we don't necessarily want to get rid of time as a real feature of the world. Um, as I as I mentioned, in the if you have the block world picture, then then you kind of do away with time as a real aspect of the world, and then you have to get try to get it back or get back our empirical experience of of the, the apparent flow of time by just assuming it in effect, you know, just saying, well, we're moving through, you know, so that, that comes in as a primitive assumption. And in contrast, if you have a real emergent ontology, such as RTI and other proposals that have, of Sorkin and, and so on, such that the the world, the, the real universe is actually emerging in some, se some sense dynamically from the quantum level or, or however, then you have the flow, the arrow of time can arise from the na nature of that emergence. So you regain, if, if you have a, a consistent account of how this emergence occurs, then the arrow of time becomes kind of a natural feature of the ontology and it, you don't have to help yourself to it. Which would mean that time travel might be impossible Yes, you know, it's so, it's so much fun to think about time travel and it, it makes for great stories. Um, and, and a lot of people really would like that uh, to, to keep the idea that, you know, we could we could go back to the past and so on. The, the fact that um, you have so many, it's so tricky to be able to do do these time travel stories in a way that doesn't get you into logical paradoxes. Um, I think tells us that maybe it's a good thing that nature might not really allow this. And, and the other thing is that, um, of course, in, in my proposal, what you're going to get 
you, you, there's a trade-off. So perhaps you'll have to you'll have to renounce the idea that we could physically, bodily, you know, transport our ourselves back in, in time and so on. But what you you have to give that idea up. But what you get instead is is real possibilities. So that possibilities are not just sort of an imaginary thing or or purely mental um, concepts, but rather they're real. They are in a sense, physically real uh, because they're precursors to space-time and, and space-time events. And so um, I find that kind of exciting, you know, the idea that um, in a possible sense, perhaps we can affect um, what does emerge so that instead of what you get perhaps, instead of time travel, is you get a sense of, since this picture involves true indeterminacy, um, you get a sense of things are not fated, you, that if you can somehow um, be aware of and, and recognize the idea that there are real possibilities in play and that the present, what we call the present, is actually sort of the cutting edge of the formation of new events, then to me that's really exciting because you have some sense that you're a participant in the creation of new events rather than just passively watching them all go by and then thinking oh maybe i could go back and fix things you know or change things um if we can't literally do that because literal time travel is not really ontologically possible what what is ontologically possible is truly crafting the present and the, the the actualities that emerge. So that's you know if you want to kind of look at the the, the cost benefit um, trade off. It, to me, it's it's more exciting to think that that there's true creativity, true originality, and and true dynamism in which the arrow of time is is telling us that uh, we actively participate in the creation of new events. Then that's kind of I think that's a cool idea, perhaps better than, than going back in time and trying to fix things that went wrong. For free will, at least more convincingly than most of the proposals I've seen, and I've read more papers in consciousness that claim somehow quantum mechanics gives us free will. RTI, on the other hand, see the links, even though there have been some criticisms I found Cider's uh, terrible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I kind of agree. I, I don't think that, I mean, yes, there are um, people, I believe Ted Cider and, um, let's see, I'm trying to remember the other name. Um, can try, Maybe, hopefully it'll pop into my head at some point, but there, there are several philosophers who have tried to um, take quantum mechanics into account and and argue that even if we have indeterminacy in, in quantum mechanics that that doesn't uh, provide um, that doesn't give us what we need in order to have free will and the idea is basically that um, the claim by by cider and others that um, that because we have rules so we have probabilistic rules such as the Born rule that that tells you what the probabilities are for any outcome of a particular measurement you might make, that you're sort of a slave to those probabilities. And I've argued that um, that this is really it's not a good argument because it assumes that the kinds of choices that people would be presented with correspond directly to quantum observables. And they really don't, you know, so it's a kind of a naive argument to say, uh, to try to make its correspondence between, say, a choice that I might make, say, whether to, you know, buy a car or not, or what kind of car to buy, that a quantum observable, observable such as measuring momentum or, or spin or something, applies to that choice, and it really doesn't. Um, so it's, it's really kind of a gross oversimplification to say that, um, because quantum observables come with these well-defined probabilities, that therefore a person presented with choices is governed by those same probabilities. So I have a I have a technical paper about this that kind of goes into some detail about why that just um 
a very crude oversimplification. And, and in fact, when people are presented with choices, there, um, deal, there's a situation that's way more complicated where their choice is does not correspond to any well-defined quantum observable. So you certainly can't rule out the idea of free choice based on saying that quantum observables are, are uh, constrained by these probabilities. So that's, that's something that I think fails. But people have really kind of, it's had a lot of currency and, and people have really kind of bought, bought this idea that choices are dictated by, by quantum probabilities and they, they really aren't. So um, it's, it's way premature to say that quantum theory doesn't help us. That seems like reductionism at its very worst, almost a pistache of reductionism. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yes. It, it's, it's amazing how eager people seem to be to, to rule out free will. Um, and of course, my position is, I, I think that we probably do have it, although I would never state that categorically. You know, I would never say, oh, we have free will and, you know, it's wrong to say that we don't. I would never say that. Uh, my point is simply that that the many claims, the many categorical claims that we don't have free will are just very premature and based on, on grossly oversimplified arguments like, like that of Cider. Um, the other thing I kind of find amusing is, is when people make these categorical claims that, they, that we don't have free will and, and for instance, Sam Harris's book on that topic kind of shows a little marionette strings, you know, holding up the, the free will title. Um, and so if you take that literally, and, and if people who make that claim apply it to themselves, then they are marionettes. And yet they, they seem to want to have it both ways. That's what I find kind of amusing, where they've basically said, I'm a marionette, everyone is a marionette. But you should think this, and you should do this, and don't, don't feel bad about it. And, and uh, it's it may be useful and to uh, to tell people that they have some free will for the benefit of society and so and, I, and I'm thinking wait a second you have no options <laughs> you know that's what ha having not having free will means you have no options you are pa you are a passive um, cog in a machine and that's what it means especially if you go so far as to you know explicitly show the marionette picture. Then, so my concern is, is just, you know, when, when people do make that move and when they do take that position, then why should we listen to them? You know, it's self-refuting basically because they're saying, I'm a marionette, I am passively being operated by invisible forces beyond my control. And in that situation, when, one, when someone makes that statement and applies that to themselves, the, then they, they say, simply can't, they're contradicting themselves if they start giving advice to people about what people should think and what their options are for you have this option to think something and you have an option to do something because they just said you have no options. So I find it kind of amusing. I think that people really need to, at least if they want to take that hard line view against free will, which again, I think is very premature, then they need to really, really take it, uh, not try to have it both ways. And I, I just see a lot of a lot of that. It's kind of amusing. <laughs> well, you can be a special kind of puppet if you want. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. You know, I think they want to be a special kind of puppet, perhaps. But, you know, they've said they're a marionette and they, they, need, to, they, they need to acknowledge that. I don't know. It's, I, I have trouble seeing, seeing it in any consistency in uh, you know, have have taken that position and then offering suggestions about how to how to deal. How can we deal with this reality that we're all marionettes? Well, you can do this and you can do that, and um, it, it, there are no options. So, if if that if what they're tr if they're what they're trying to do is present options for how to behave, then they they are kind of contradicting themselves because there there are no options. There are no choices. I mean, they said there are, there are no real choices. So I think it's a little bit self-refuting.
Or at the very least, it all seems futile, but... Of course. I mean, to be logically consistent, um, if clearly if someone's a cog in a machine, um, if you want to look at a line of dominoes, you know, if you want to... That's the basic argument. The argument is that there's this cause and effect that they think permeates all of all of existence and it essentially it's essentially deterministic or if they want to allow for indeterminism then they say it's completely random so either way if you want to think of yourself you, you the picture is that of a line of dominoes subject to a, either just simply the initial condition of someone knocking down the first domino or random outside forces over which each domino has no control so given that you know so we're sentient dominoes that's that is the ontology that is the picture so it's it's really in you know if you're a sentient domino and all you can do is respond to external forces and have no sense of true volition then that is kind of a few, that is a futile picture if you if you really do if you're consistent about it um so that's i think that's a position that those folks are in that people who take that view are literally saying uh, essentially that you are a sentient domino and and then it's as if someone's trying to counsel each domino to find a reason to find meaning in their situation and and i think any domino with a brain knows there is no meaning in that situation it's the meaning is is contained in the outside forces and whoever set up the situation, perhaps they had some some idea or or some creativity or something. But if the if if we are just sentient dominoes, then the only meaning in that is is perhaps um, stoicism. Okay, I'm gonna just fall because they told me to. So I think if you if you're if you really face up to the implications of that ontology then then the the correct the correct uh, assessment is that there's no real meaning in that so it's trying to have it both ways to tell people you know hi you're a sentient domino you are passive you're totally passive and you are react all you do is react to external forces and so on now find meaning in that well that's just silly you know that's just that's just self-refuting there's been a very long history of different think movers who've tried to grossly oversimplify human psychology, most notably the behaviorists throughout the 20th century. But RTI also ties in with some other pretty major questions in science. As you mentioned, Ernst Mach and Boltzmann, that controversy in your books. And it has parallels to what happened in psychology in the 20th century, namely that sometimes scientists become overly fixated on only what's observable. Right, right. Observable. Yeah, it's a very positivistic kind of, um, you know, that that's it's such a tension in science because I think um, physicists who who do um, tend toward inst toward positivism and, and and empiricism? I think their heart is in the right place. In that, um, the great success of science and and the physical sciences is largely due to um, insisting that uh, we don't go off into flights of fancy and imagine whatever we want the world to be like. That that experiment is. It has to be the final arbiter of what what we're allowed to, uh, you know, what what's worthy of being considered a good explanation and a good theory. And so I I totally respect the idea that um, empirical experiment and and um, the quality control of of doing experiments and checking predictions and having having predictions is is extremely important so i i never want to you know undermine that or or you know have people think that i don't uh, that i don't value it it's crucial it's a crucial aspect of of physical science so the the dilemma we face however is in um uh you know the idea of of theory theory construction theory coming up with a theory i think we need to make a different a distinction between 
theory development, theory construction, um, and testing of theories. Because certainly, whether we buy a theory or not um, has to do with how good is it, does it work, does, does, is it corroborated, and so on. And we have to have that. But I, I think where we get into trouble, where empiricists can kind of um, perhaps uh, shoot, shoot themselves in the foot, perhaps, and, and um, maybe miss the point of what scientific progress and discovery is all about is that is that we have to also be imaginative and creative and allow ourselves to explore metaphysical pictures that can lead us to new theory construction and, and designing new theories even if maybe we don't we can't point to something observable that would correspond to them so that's why you know to these concepts so that's why i like to point to the the that historical episode of of Ludwig Boltzmann with his atoms is his atomic hypothesis, and his conflict with with Mach Ernst Mach, who was pretty much a strict uh, empiricist positivist and so on. That I can under we can understand how scientists like Mach might have been skeptical about these unobservable hypothetical metaphysical atoms. Um, for which we had no empirical uh, evidence. However, um, as we all know, um, Boltzmann's theory worked very well, and it has certainly, as far as its predictions and being able to lead to empirical corroboration, it has worked very well. So, so that's um, that's what I think we need to keep in mind: is that using our imagination in the sense of um, contemplating possible underlying metaphysical uh, aspects of reality that we could never point to, never, we could never say, Boltzmann could not say, hi, you know, here's an atom. He couldn't point to an atom and say, here's why you should take this seriously. But his work really showed how a new uh, metaphysical viewpoint that, that starts out as something perhaps purely metaphysical can be very, very fruitful. So th this is, I think, the caution, the take home lesson from that whole episode is that if we want to be very strictly empiricist and try to rule out um, what might be considered metaphysical speculation, um, then we're going to foreclose possible avenues of discovery. And that I think would be a, a big mistake. So, I, I mean, I, I think though what the new the new challenge that that quantum theory presents to us beyond what what Boltzmann was dealing with is that the theory um, does if you if you look at the theory and you try to figure out well what is it referring to what is the physical referent of this theory clearly it's not space time it's not it's not space-time events, it's not space-time processes. And so that is a new challenge that, uh, that goes beyond what Boltzmann was dealing with because he never thought of atoms as something that we're not in space-time, you know? So, so in, that ex in that sense, it wasn't as radical as, as what, what I'm exploring and perhaps some others are exploring that, that faced with quantum theory and the fact that it works so well and if we want to be realist about it and try to figure out well, what is it describing, clearly based on its mathematical structure, which is much more, um, it has many more dimensions and has a mathematical character that, that shows that it cannot be talking about space time. It's talking about a bigger structure, this Hilbert space structure that is hugely multidimensional. So what it is talking about, what its structure reflects is clearly not space time processes. And that's the new challenge. Um, and I respect people who say, well, look, if, you know, I, I am only going to consider something valid if it's empirically corroborated, then I cannot tell them, okay, my po the possibilities that I propose to you that I think is what quantum theory is talking about, um, here's a test to find them. Well, that's the challenge, you can't. You can't tell someone how to go do an experiment and detect these possibilities you know, directly as possibilities because by their very nature, they are precursors to space-time events, and it's the space-time events that provide our observable empirical corroborations. So that's where you know some people might say, "Well, I don't want to go there," um, and that's that's where we are. We're sort of at the place where 
physics meets philosophy and that if we want to have a have a physical physical insight into what the theory is describing then we're at a point where we can't point to space and time and say here's what it's describing we have to really take seriously the idea that what it's describing is something that transcends space time so that's the new challenge i think goes beyond what boltzmann was doing and even math but entirely immune to uncertainty leonard euler and his his no slouches in the intellectual department. We're not so sure about imaginary numbers, even though since the very real applications. Yes, isn't that isn't that intriguing that that mathematicians could come up with these seemingly crazy flights of fancy, right? These imaginary numbers, you know, meaning that they they aren't about anything real. They're just some cool idea that you know I came up with that. But of course, we we found out that they really do seem to have physical applications. And um, yes, I think it was Euler um, who perhaps noted that if we conceive of imaginary numbers in a different way and think of them more as a rotational kind of number that allows for a new direction 90 degrees instead of either 0 or 180 then then we can gain some kind of insight into what the so-called imaginary unit is about so the the whole like lesson from that i think is when you you've got these rules about how to how to manipulate numbers and so on which is um where we have real numbers and you cannot have um, a, a negative real number. You cannot have a solution for that qualifies as a real number to finding the square root of a negative number. But in fact, you can find a solution to it. And in fact, apparently it's very useful and it, it has some important meaning and, and seems to apply to processes in nature. So that's, I think, a good another good counterexample to the idea that, uh, you know, we need to hold on to our 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 notions about what counts as real. And that's, I think that's the challenge here that um, being, uh, you know, creatures that are embedded in the world of appearance and that certainly it's important to make your way around the world of, of appearance, um, but that we need to be careful about assuming that the world of appearance exhausts what we can sit what we can consider real. So I think that's the real lesson here that once again, ima so-called imaginary numbers got that name because it was thought that they couldn't be about anything real, but that was wrong. They turned out to have to be describing things that, uh, that, that have do give rise to results and empirical phenomena that can be corroborated. So I think the big lesson here is that we need to continually be um, ready to revise our notion about what counts as real. And of course, I'm sure a lot of our listeners thought of Plato and Kant as you were talking about this. This is a very rich tradition in the West and the East. Right, of course, Plato, uh, you know, noted that there's the world of appearance, but that doesn't exhaust all of reality. And, and for Plato, there, the, the underlying aspect of reality was, was also very real. Um, for him, it was a world of perfect forms, which, which was fairly abstract. But, um, you know, there are, a lot, there are a lot of parallels, I think, between Plato's idea of sort of a hidden or more profound fundamental reality that was that you couldn't see you could not directly perceive and experience with your five senses but was nevertheless real um, quantum theory is perhaps making us uh, consider the idea that you know you could say that maybe quantum objects because they seem more abstract which of course was something that always bothered Niels Bohr this is what he would say you know quantum objects are abstract um, and they, they seem abstract simply because they're, they're intangible, 
and at least on the level of ordinary experience, they're intangible and they're described by this, this mathematical formalism. So they seem much more abstract. And in that sense, it could have something in common with, with Plato's world of perfect forms. Although there's also a lot of difference too, because um, as I've proposed, the, the, uh, the idea that I've proposed regarding quantum systems and quantum entities is that they are very dynamical. They're not sort of these, these perfect forms, um, but yet they do have more, they're, they're not static in the sense of, I think, Plato's ideas of, of geometrical figures and that sort of thing. So they're not, they're not just geometrical figures and purely mathematical entities. They're, they have kind of a, a more concrete sense a sense of existence than simple concepts like geometric concepts which i think was was plato's idea so there's some difference there but um as far as kant goes um of course kant felt that um you could make his distinction was the uh world of appearance and the noumenal world which was the sort of hidden hidden underlying reality which of course for kant was unknowable um, he he assumed that if something was not part of the world of appearance, uh, the manifest um, kind of domain that you could you could interact with with your five senses, that it was unknowable. And of course, I'm contesting that. I'm saying, well, that just because we cannot directly experience the quantum domain with our five senses, in the, in the sense that we can't point to, uh, you can't can't be in a lab and say here here I'm you know I'm I've got an electron you know that I'm pointing to here um, we can only sense them indirectly through their detections and, and amplified kinds of phenomena so they are elusive in that sense but but we can know something of them because of the theory that was kind of forced upon upon the early uh, you know pioneers of quantum theory such that our theory is describing them in some sense. So that's where I would part company with, with Kant because he presupposed that if you can't contact it directly with your five senses that you can't, you can't know it. And, you know, I, I think that's, that was a little bit of a, a leap that, that wasn't necessarily warranted. But the parallels are still there, this distinction between the world of appearance and the underlying reality. So I think that's what's so intriguing about where modern physics has taken us it's kind of taken us to this doorway that that is at the very the very final um final doorway like sort of if you will the exit door of of our world of appearance um and if we're if we want to stay in the world of empirical science we can't really walk through that exit door but that doesn't mean that there's nothing out there and there are good reasonable ways to extrapolate based on the, the success of the theory, the structure of the theory. And, and if we kind of explore the idea that uh, things might be real, they might be part of the, the hidden apparatus, if you will, that holds up our, our empirical realm, that uh, it's doing a lot of work, you know? It's sort of like, again, with the iceberg metaphor in, in my books, that, that the space-time realm is this tip of the iceberg. That's what you can see. But just because that's the all that you can see doesn't mean there's nothing else there. And in fact, there are good reasons to think that there's a lot going on behind the scenes to 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 hold up this this world of appearance. One reason why I think the block world and ideas similar to it in different domains are appealing is because it answers questions of how and why, whereas in RTI. It's hard to see why one transaction takes place over another, aside from, like we talked about, the probability rises. But when you have Burden's ass there, you have this donkey looking at two piles of hay. The question is, why did it choose one pile over the other? Right. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I think in if if there's a block world ontology then i'm not sure i mean for, for me that wouldn't really necessarily be satisfying as far as a, a answering questions about 
why and how everything happened because to me that just kind of shoves the little lump in the carpet under <laughs> under the furniture because then you're sort of begging the question of well how did it get it set up in this way you're sort of you know you're sort of just deferring these ultimate questions to well okay we we've got this block world we've got all this we've got everything going on that uh everything's accounted for all events are there but that just begs the question of well then you're simply saying well i don't have to tell you how how it got there you know i don't i don't that's just i'm not going to do that so um you know that's one thing people people can opt for again there's no dynamics there there there's the problem is that then you have to presuppose that people are moving through it and you can't explain why you know like a rock would not experience moving through the block world whereas a person does and at what point does that experience arise and there are all kinds of questions that they can't answer that they don't answer so it, it's not as if uh, you know it's not as if it's a it's a great solution to getting around questions i think it's more just um an abdication of certain questions perhaps but you know th that's that's something that that people may want to do if if they don't like the idea of of expanding you know what what it means to be real as far as the um the indeterminacy that you uh, that you spoke of this i get i think is easier to maybe um entertain if one goes back to the idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking so um you know elsewhere in physics we do have situations such as with the higgs mechanism where we have we have theories in which we get a bunch of solutions and there is no causal reason for why a particular uh, solution is realized is actualized so in a sense we already have that in physics in pretty well physical theories so um, now as far as you know someone might say well in a block world the the Higgs mechanism corresponds to just the, the way our block world is and so once again they decline to answer the question and it's just sort of it's just there that's just the way it is so I'm not sure that you know anyone who says okay well spontaneous symmetry breaking is okay they're not really in a position to to criticize the idea that there's no obvious cause that you can point to that will tell you why one transaction gets actualized over others they can't you know unless they're willing to say well there there's a problem with spontaneous symmetry breaking in the higgs mechanism they other than just saying well that's just what happened and that's just the way it is so i think i think anyone who takes seriously the idea that that physical theories give us situations where the theory will just simply not give you a reason for why one particular possible answer or solution is is actualized over others they they need to avoid a double standard in saying that's not a problem say for the higgs mechanism but it is a problem for which transaction gets actualized so that's that's one one issue i think where um at least if anyone who who's okay with spontaneous symmetry breaking then certainly at that level that that can apply to the transactional picture but the the other neat thing i think that is the whole idea that perhaps nature does have and this isn't part of my interpretation but if we want to get into you know questions of ultimate questions about even in the sense of the Higgs mechanism or other instances of spontaneous symmetry breaking and Buridan's ass, why would one solution be actualized and not others if we can't point to some obvious space time um, or, or even at a deeper level, some, uh, some cause that will trip the wire towards one and, and, and away from another solution? this i think is the only place where real volition could come in so so that if we're going to have free will then in a sense quantum theory or or any instance like that of where you have real possibilities and you and it is truly indeterministic as to which one will be actualized then this is actually great because this is where volition can come in and and volition by its nature is something that that has to be outside what's considered the normal mechanical cause and effect because the the minute you've got mechanical cause and effect one-to-one -one input you know particular input leading uniquely to one output 
then there's no volition there. There can be no volition there because by its very nature, volition is something that's kind of an external intervention in the otherwise causal flow of events. So that's what I find intriguing about this, that if, if we're gonna have any free will, which I you know, would never categorically say we do, but, but we might. And it, if there's going to be any free will at all, any true volition, then it seems to me that this is the ideal place, the ideal opening for it, where we can't, you know, where the, the donkey's sitting there and he has no um, compelling reason, no obvious causal reason for choosing one over the other. True volition means he can choose one for no reason at all. I mean, and it sounds sounds kind of crazy and, and um, irrational almost in a way. And that's what I think a lot of philosophers uh, are queasy about when they when they want to deal with questions of volition. But ultimately, that's what it means. It means you don't have to give a reason for why you did something. And so obviously this is very intriguing for, for moral implications because of course we want to be able to give reasons in a moral context um, and it, but it doesn't rule out the ability to say, here's my considerations, um, you know, that, that I'm choosing this for this reason or for other reasons. So the idea that if you're down to the brute fact of volition, it means at the level of that hungry donkey, you know, he's saying, look, I want, I'm going to stay alive. <laughs> so I'm just going to pick one and my my choice to stay alive means I can't give a reason for why I chose one, but I'm going to do it anyway. So that that to me, that's what real volition is at the fundamental level. So it's it's kind of um kind of an interesting interesting concept that ultimately, if all things are equal, that you have to be able to choose for no reason, and that's really what volition boils down to. If we're going to go to an a situation where all things truly are equal, of course, and in the moral sphere, they aren't all equal. And that's why it's consistent to say, look, things are not all equal. I should make this choice because, you know, if, if I choose otherwise, a bunch of people will die or so on. So in a moral context, things are not all equal. But in, this, in the situation with quantum theory, uh, you know, in a sense, all, thing, all other things are equal. And so if, say if you're a photon deciding whether to go through a polarizer or not, you just choose and you don't have to give a reason. <laughs> so um, it's, it's, it's fascinating. But that I think that the point is that if we're ever gonna get true volition, that's our opening and that's where we get it, just from genuine quantum indeterminacy. I suppose one last question. I'm reminded of, part of John Kramer's book, Quantum Handshake, and he, undergraduates and even graduate students are rarely asked to interpret formalism because the approach is to shut up and calculate. Yeah. Is there any value? I think that if we want to think of science as um, a way in which we learn about our world, um, then clearly we're, we're not going to learn about our world if we just adopt instrumentalism, shut up and calculate to the quantum formalism. So that to me is, is basically a choice to shy away from the, the challenging questions of what might quantum theory be teaching us about reality. And um again this gets back to the the dilemma of uh empirical science and do how do we want to deal with the fact that quantum theory seems to have shown us the exit door of our realm of empirical science in the sense that um quantum theory will not allow us to to say that um whatever it is whatever it is describing is something that is in the empirical world so it's a choice that people need to make for themselves um there is no since we're interpreting and if we're dealing with interpretations that are that are empirically equivalent in the sense that you can't test them you can't say you know 
tr the transactional picture is the correct interpretation o over other interpretations, then that's a, that's a dilemma at the very core of what science is and so on. Now, I, I personally think that there are other ways to decide among various interpretations even that are empirically equivalent. And one I th one selling point for, for TI and RTI is that it does provide, it's, it is a model. It's a model that who, whose concepts um, are, again, precursors to the, 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 the entities that, that are in the model or the quantum possibilities or quantum potentialities are precursors to space-time events, but they also predict the Born rule. So, I, as in, you know, cases where, you know, you have, when you have novel prediction, that's, a, it's, it's, it's an instance of a prediction of a model, um, even though it's not, it's already something that you were working with. So in the, it, it's not a novel prediction in that sense, but it predicts a rule or a mathematical pro procedure that prior to that model, prior to the transactional model was purely ad hoc, was purely just simply a recipe that seemed to work. So the ability of the transactional interpretation to predict this, the Born rule, the, the, the quantum probability rule, I think is, a, is, is an instance of novel prediction of the model. So in that sense, even though you can't test you can't test the idea that there, there are offer waves and confirmation waves and so on, you can't empirically test that. However, you do have a novel prediction of that model of con offers confirmations and, and their interaction that is described by the Born rule. And so that in a sense is a novel prediction. So that's something where um, when we're interpreting and we're, we're constructing perhaps what might be called metaphysical models, if they do yield fruit, as I think the transactional picture is, then then that certainly is is a standard aspect of of physical theory, and that's kind of what Boltzmann was doing when he came up with when he was proposing his purely metaphysical atoms, and had a model that I think some some people refer to as a constructive model rather than a principal model. His model was able to predict laws that were already known. To work the, the laws of thermodynamics so i think we're seeing parallels here and in that sense what might be considered mere interpretation is really a kind of model construction that is yielding real fruit so that's that's what i would you know tell people when when they're concerned about perhaps about just going off into metaphysical speculation on on the contrary this is really a, a, a specific model that yields specific predictive fruits even though the certain aspects of the model can't be empirically tested in, in the sense of, you know, we can't, can't go into our lab and detect offer waves or confirmation waves. But at least indirectly, we get that corroboration. Beautiful. I think that's a great way to end it.